Matthew chapter 22. You want to find your place there or we'll have the words on the screen. You can follow along. Begin reading in verse 38. If you have your Bibles, you found your places, you're physically able, stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Jesus speaking, answering a Pharisee who has asked what is the greatest law. We dealt with it last week in worshiping God. That's in verse 37, but then he says this in verse 38. This is the first and great commandment. What is that? That is that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But then verse 39, and the second is like it. One step further, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now this is where the rubber hits the road. Loving God is not some mystical thing where you can go through life and say, I love God and God knows it and I don't care what anybody else thinks. I I don't care what that need is. I just love God. And worship has become somewhat of this mystical experience that never places the shoe leather of your feet, your shoes on the road to live out. And I'm telling you, it is time in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth for the church to go one step further. You love the Lord your God with all your heart. Number two, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then listen to verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now let me just give you the JMH translation. Look at me. Get these two right, and everything else falls into place. Father, speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, please. The second commandment involves the same virtue as the first, love, same word. This commandment calls for the same genuine love for others that you have for God. It's like God saying, do you love me? The same way you love me, love others. Now, boy, that's something, isn't it? With that godly, godly agape-type love, you're out there loving me, you love others with the same degree, the same word, the same intensity. I wrote four statements. It is choice purposeful. Uh, God chose to set his love upon us. And the Bible teaches when God places his love in us, we love him, and we do also, we choose to set that love on others. I'm extremely encouraged this morning. I stayed off the computer since Monday, which is a miracle, until last night when I turned it on, and I had hundreds of emails. And so I took the time to read every last one of them And one lady writes and says, I was going to file for divorce and God captured my heart as though he knocked the wind out of me last Sunday. And I've asked my husband to forgive me. I've asked God to forgive me. And I realized that love is not about feelings. It is a choice. If God were a God who loved us based on the way he felt, based on how we responded, we'd all be crispy critters. But it's a love of choice, purposeful. Number two, it's intentional love. I mean, you're intentional about this. I mean, you have the eyes of God in your heart and you're looking for opportunities that the love of God may flow through you. It's an active love. It's not dormant. It's not merely sentimental and emotional. It's not ooey-gooey. It is a practical love, pragmatism loving others the second greatest commandment this is interesting don't miss this i didn't know this the second greatest commandment is the most often quoted old testament text in the new testament nothing is quoted out of the old testament more than love thy neighbor as thyself he said i want you to get it and i'm going to say it over and over again you shall love your neighbor as yourself anyone with whom we have contact that's who your neighbor is when I'm on a plane whoever's sitting beside me hello neighbor move into a neighborhood somebody next door to you hello neighbor out walking through the neighborhood three blocks away meet someone up there hello neighbor 
Matter of fact, this morning, good morning, neighbors. Whoever you are in contact with is the biblical de definition of neighbors. It means when you love a neighbor, you will only do what is in their best interests. I'm going to give you three statements, God willing. I think I can work my way through this this morning. I'm going to talk to you about three words, and then I'm going to define them in the context of a person. The first word I want to talk to you about is the word others. And I want to call this individual the caring person. Now, if I want to understand what the Lord Jesus meant when he said, love your neighbor, I ask myself the question, Lord, did you ever define who the neighbor is and show us how we're to love them in the Bible? And he said, I certainly did. So let me read it for you. In, in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, with all, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly, this do, and you will live. You may say, wait a minute, was Jesus changing the way a person goes to heaven? No. The reason he said, you do this and you'll live, he knew that nobody could live up to the full standard of the law. They would always come up short, which would show them grace, that the law was a schoolmaster that would take you to Jesus. It is almost as if the lawyer said to himself, well, I know I love God, but who is my neighbor? And the prevailing opinion among the scribes and the Pharisees of which this lawyer would have been was that one's neighbors were the righteous alone. Don't miss this. This is somewhere I need to stay for a moment. The prevailing opinion among the scribes and Pharisees of the first century was that one's neighbor were the righteous only. That is, uh, we ought to just love our brothers and sisters. We ought to just love those that are among our ranks. To them in the first century, rank sinners and especially Samaritans were to be hated because they were the enemies of God. So to them, the rank sinners, Samaritans, were to be hated because they were enemies of God. Where did they get that from? If you want to make a note, look it up. It's in Psalms 139, verse 21 and 22. They elevated hostility towards sinners to a statue of virtue. Did you hear what I just said? Wow, that is a one-liner. But now, let's see what Jesus has to say on others. We're in the context of the story of the Good Samaritan. Listen, make sure you see this. Uh, good master, what have I got to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus is going to tell him how you love others by the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, the story of the Good Samaritan, let me just remind you. Remember, there's a man that has gone down from Jericho. And I've been on the Jericho Road, not in the first century, but I've been there in the 20th century. And I'm telling you, it's a winding road. It's a scary bus ride. Scariest part of the entire trip to Israel is on the Jericho Road. Now, the Bible says there's a man, and this man's been beat up. And here's what the Scripture says of him. He's been robbed. Don't miss this. He's been stripped. He's been wounded. And he's leaving him half dead. My Bible says in John chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. How many of you know this morning that we have an enemy called the devil? He has demons. One-third of all the demons that were in heaven fell, and they are in their demonic activities. There's powers and principalities. Ephesians 6 says, and they are here to do this. Jesus came to give us life. They've come to rob us, to strip us, to wound us, and leave us half dead. Let's start with the pastor, the preacher. He's called a priest in the New Testament. And let me tell you what I'm going to learn from the story. Now, remember, there's a man half dead. Three people are going to come by, Kurt, to see him. Priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. And the first one that comes by, here's the word that I, I, on my knees before God, the Lord Jesus Christ put this word in my heart. The first man represents a churchman that when it comes to being a neighbor, he is distance. He's distant. Some people are distant. See, you, don't, you may not mean to, but you may be distant in this congregation. Just kind of come in, find your little place, go out, make sure everything's catered to in your name instead of coming here. But listen to this. The Bible says in Luke 10, 31, now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. I'm going to tell you what. There is a man over there with needs. 
but I'm going to keep my distance. Y'all come on in. We're going we, to gonna have to talk. I'm going to have to lower my voice to say this or somebody will think I'm, I'm angry. Y'all okay? 1,711. 1,711 people came to hear me preach last week but didn't go to a small group. You love God. You're just having trouble with others. But that's not why I'm going out. Let's benefit it out. Some of you have got to go to a job or whatever and you work on Sunday, you can't go. But really, there really is a large number of people. How can you love others if you don't know them, if you keep your distance? So we're going, going to the others. Here, here's what I believe this man would have said. I wrote down several things. This, this pre, he's a preacher, isn't that something? What a, what a shame for a preacher to be like this. He sees a man over there. He's been robbed, stripped, wounded, and he's leave, left him half dead. And here's what he says. Look at me, look at me. It's not my problem. What else does he say? I don't know him. By the way, did you know that's true in here? I don't know him. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. No, but I'm going to get to know as many as I can. I'm busy. That preacher might have had a preaching assignment. He ain't got time to deal with people that have needs. He's got to go preach. I got other things to do. I, I got my job to do. Uh oh. Somebody else will help him. Oh, that's good. There it is. There it is. I know a need. I'm praying that somebody else will do it. Distance. And by the way, I'm, I'm talking about my own types. Preacher, that's distant. The Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse 29, but he wanting to justify himself. That's what we want to do. Let me just wait, wait. Hey, time out, time out. You hadn't heard my side of the story. Let me justify myself. He said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And by the way, this reveals his self-righteous character. And then Luke chapter 16, verse 14, listen to this statement. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. That means they turned their noses up at the Lord Jesus Christ. You may turn your nose up at me. I doubt it. You like me. He said to them, you are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your heart. The Bible word is wisdom. Number two, there's a Levite. He's a servant of God. Here's the word as I was praying, asking God, show me in this message what you want me to say. The word that came to my mind is, here's a man of discernment. There's one that's distanced, but here, this guy's pretty discerning. The Bible says, likewise, a Levite, verse 32, when he arrived at the place, came and looked, he looked, and passed by on the other side. He could have got to town and asked that preacher, did you see the man back there beaten, left half dead? Well, I couldn't hardly see him. I was so far on the other side of the road. Oh, I went over and looked at him. He was discerning. He could tell you what the need is. You have not become a, a, a neighbor when you can identify the need. Oh, I like, I'm so glad I'm preaching. You become a neighbor when you meet a need. <laughs> God. And so we feel good that we can discern. Hey, who knows what's going on with that family? Oh, I know. I called them. I emailed them. I know what's going on. You're not a neighbor because you know what their need is. You're a neighbor because you're willing to meet the need. That's what a neighbor is. I need to get into your lives and find out what's going on. How can we help meet the need? Well, what, what, what do you think went through the mind of this Levite? Hmm. He probably said this. I'll tell you what, that old boy back there on the road, he needs intensive care. He might have even asked this question. Woo, he was beat up pretty bad. I wonder how much it cost to get him fixed. Hey, before you get involved, I just want to tell you now, this thing's going to be long and drawn out. This old boy's sick. You can't just, hey, hey, you can't just do it in what we used to doing, like that little girl that ran across here. She was fast. We want to get it over now. See, I knew I'd get it in an illustration. It makes me feel so good. Hey, here's one. Here's one. Look at me. Look at me. Hey. His problem's not my problem. I got enough of my own problems. We're talking about being a neighbor. And then he had to say it too. Someone else would come along and help him. So sure enough, somebody came along, a half-breed. 
Hey, you know what historians say? It was dangerous for the Good Samaritan to be on the road because people didn't like him. They beat him up not to rob him, just to beat him up. So I'm a pastor. There's people in this city. I know it's going to shock you that don't like me. They don't want to beat me up and rob me. They just like to beat me up. <laughs> so the Good Samaritan, he, hey, let me say something to, you, to, to the Good Samaritans. You better stay off of that road. But no, he's going down the road. Look what the Bible says in verse, Luke chapter 10, verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, when he journeyed, he came to where he was. Oh, and when he saw him, he had compassion, pity. Deepest word in the New Testament for caring for people. He went, on, he, he went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured on wine and oil, set him on his own animal, brought him to the inn, took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two days' salary, two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him. Whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Here's what God said to my heart. I mean, this scripture just came alive to me this week. It says in verse 33, he came where he was. That's exactly what Jesus did for me. I was lost, undone without God. I couldn't come to God, and God came to me. Let, let me tell you what he did when he got there. Here's the words, because I'm, I want to be a neighbor. What does a neighbor do? He had compassion. He cared for people. Does, does your heart... You may not believe it, and it's just it's between me and God. I, I'll give an account to God if I say anything that's not true. My heart stays pretty heavy that I can't meet every need that comes to me. And what, what I mean is I can't even get to them. I'm not talking about I don't want to attempt to try to meet them. I can't even get to all of them, just like you. But, I mean, it just happens to be that my name may be the one that everybody does know around here. And the bottom line is you can't meet them all. But it's not that I'm going to try, quit trying. It doesn't mean that I'm discouraged. It's just that, Wow. Let me tell you what else he did. He bandaged his wounds. Can I say something to you? It must cost you to get mighty bloody to really care for people. Hey, Melanie, their hands got dirty. He poured on oil and wine. Wait a minute, that cost something. Oil and wine was not cheap, but he used it. He cared for him. The Bible says he set him on his own animal inconvenienced him he was willing to walk that the other man might be able to ride I'm about to have a spell up here preaching all this stuff we're talking about being a neighbor then it says he brought him to an end took care of him wait a minute took care of him that means he spent the night with him now there's delays I can't get where I need to get because I'm busy being a neighbor I'm telling you it is inconvenient to be a neighbor but it is the right thing to do and then he took out two denarii as though he hadn't already done enough. And two denarii would be equivalent to two days' salary. What is your salary per day? And then he said to the innkeeper, whatever more you spend, I'm going to be coming back here through in a couple of days, and I'll settle up. And by the way, when he seen what he could do, he knew he could flat be trusted to pay the rest of the bill. And then it talks about Jesus, the deliverer. He's in this picture too, so let's talk about him quickly. He, he is the truth. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 36, said, they said, so which, Jesus said, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? He said, he who showed mercy on him. And then, then Jesus said, here it is, then Jesus said, then Jesus said, go and do likewise. Look at me this morning. You want to be a neighbor? You want to love others like you love yourself? Go. And do like the good Samaritan. Go and be a neighbor. Go and find a need and meet it. Go find somebody hurting and love on them, embrace them, have compassion on them, and pray for them. Let's start being Jesus with skin on. Let me go a step further. The second word quickly is ourselves. It's what I could call, if it's not properly understood, if it's more of a self-love, like America interprets, it could become the consuming person. If you don't watch it, you come to First Baptist Church Woodstock, instead of being a contributor, you're a consumer. And I want you to, I want you to receive when you come, but I want you to give. I'm talking about of your life, of yourself. He said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is not commanding that a person love himself, but he assumed he already does love himself. I love myself. Don't you love yourself? When I got up this morning, I thought, ooh, my teeth need brushing in the worst kind of way. Matter of fact, thank God for something to gargle. And look at this hair. Is this in a mess? I care for me. Go to work, hair dryer. 
Where's the hairspray? Oh, and that hairspray gets all in your eyes when you sweat. I mean, it's just amazing. See, I look out for my own welfare. When my body registers that I'm hungry, I feed me. When my body says I'm thirsty, I get me something to drink. When my body says I'm tired, I look out for me. Look it up, phone number one. I love myself. But how's the command to be interpreted in this text? The command is to pursue meeting the physical health and spiritual well-being of one's neighbors, all with the same intensity and concern as one naturally does for himself. Listen to to Ephesians 5.29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth and combeth his hair, just as the Lord does the church. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4. It's the same thing. Let me move on. The passage serves as the acid test. There's an acid test that reveals my heart. You can't see my heart, but if you hang around me, my heart will be revealed. You ever said this about somebody? He's a good-hearted old fella. That is the sweethearted lady. Listen to James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, uh, Hey, brother, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Let me tell you what this is. If you'd say, Pastor Johnny... Break it down in as low as common denomination you can. When the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself, you've defined who our neighbor is, it's ever who we're in contact with. I go into Sunday school, and Marty stands up, and he says, uh, today we're taking a benevolent offering. There is a family that's been attending our class, and their son's sick, and the husband's out of job, and we need to take an offering. I don't have to say, who are they? I don't even know them. You don't have to know them to be your neighbor. Wow, you don't have to know them to be your neighbor. All you have to know is God. If you know God, you know that everyone you come in contact with is your neighbor. All right, here's the lowest common denominator. It's the golden rule. It's the golden rule. Matthew 7, 10, 7, 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophet. By the way, there cannot be words of compassion without works of compassion. Man, there's a family in need. I'm so concerned. Ask this question. Oh, you're concerned, are you? Mm, What have you done? And if they can't tell you anything they've done, they lied. They're not concerned. It makes them feel good to say they're concerned. They discern, but they're keeping their distance. Mark 12, 31, here's clarity. Jesus said it again. The second like it, this, you shall love your neighbors yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Genuine love for God is, in, is followed in importance by genuine love for people. Listen to 1 John 4, 7, and then I've close with one last statement. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. I actually display my love for God by my love for other people. Here's what I, here's what I wrote in my notes, this statement. Man, he hit it right on the button. That was right on the button. Let me give you one last statement, and I'm through. The third word I wrote was the word outlook, the conscience person. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, now the purpose of the commandment is love, there it is, from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. Conscience is a word that translates with knowledge. It's that instinctive sense of right and wrong, God-given, self-judging faculty God placed in me. The Bible says that God has written his law on man's heart, Romans 2.15. 1 Timothy 1.5 type love is the choice and will characterized by self-denial and self-sacrifice for the benefit of others, and it's the mark of true Christianity. Now, remember he said this, and I'm through. Matthew 22, 40. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Now, what in the world? What do you mean? What do you mean there's ten commandments? How can I take just two? Love God and love others. Worship God, love others. How can I take those two and hang everything out, all of the law and all the prophets says? All right, listen to this. What do you mean love does no wrong to a neighbor? The Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. If you love someone as a neighbor, you are not 
going to commit adultery. And so that law is fulfilled in the fact that you love God and you love other people, and you know that's wrong. Number two, you shall not murder. If I love someone, if I love God and worship God, and I love you, if I love you, I'm not going to kill you. Uh, You shall not steal. If I love God and I love others, I'm not going to steal. So hang it on there. Hang it on there. You shall not covet. I don't want what you've got. I really don't. In Jesus' name, I don't want what you've got. I don't need what you've got. I only desire as your pastor to lead you to love God and love other people. He says you can put the entire moral duty under two categories, worship God, love others. So the first deals with the first four commandments. Loving God will help you not to have any idol before him. And then the second, love others, deals with the last six commandments. The entire passage prompts believers to measure their love for others by what they wish for themselves. One came to Jesus, and he he thought he got it right. He said, man, I've done all that stuff. And then Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus was emphasizing that he was not in the kingdom. He was saying it's not by just trying to say, well, I do this and I do that, kind of like trying to conform to some outward law, but we've got to love and obey the one who gives the commandment. And that's why we ought to do it. It ought to be out of a pure heart, just loving God, loving others. You just, you just learn to start caring for other people. It's, it's tough to start with because I think by nature that most of us, I'll just speak for myself. Most of us by nature are stingy and greedy. God has to do a work of grace in our heart for us to become generous people where we want to want to do things. Let's stand. Father, stand up with me. In Jesus' name, help us not to be like the priest. Help us not to be like the Levite, but help us to be like the Samaritan, that good Samaritan who went over and compassionately cared and got dirty and delayed his own schedule and stopped thinking about himself and met the needs of someone. Please help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.